Hello again, I am Blunty. Behind me, as you may be able to see, I am currently exploring the Bovington Tank Museum. I let a stop on my uh, tour of tank stuff here in London, thanks to Wargaming, who brought me up here. And I'm surrounded by just, well, literally a hundred years of military history. The tank, the vehicle that changed the game of warfare, the vehicle that took World War I from a stagnant, trench-based, literally a war stuck in the mud, to once more being a mobile, aggressive, attacking war, instead of one just stuck in the trenches throwing grenades at each other and stuff. Don't know how accurate that is, I'm not a historian, but let me show you some of these tanks. The program for tanks actually started in 1914 when they recognised um, the need for some sort of um, solution to machine guns to trench warfare. Um, and it was a, a, a British soldier, a Royal Engineer, called Major Ernest Swinton, who came up with the idea that perhaps a metal box slung between some caterpillar tracks from a tractor with a weapon could make its way across no man's land, knock out the machine guns and return mobility to the battlefield. The idea was picked up by um, an agricultural machinery company called Fosters, who were based up in Lincolnshire uh, in the, uh, the middle of the UK, um, and they basically started to build um, this vehicle using some imported Caterpillar tracks from um, the, uh, the, the Texas Creeping Grip Tractor Company in Chicago in the USA. They put the components together and they created Little Willie. So Little Willie is considered by most historians to be the first tank, the first armoured fighting vehicle. However, the tracks that were actually uh, brought over didn't do the job they wanted to do. They had a, a, an annoying habit um, of sagging down underneath the vehicle when it went over an obstacle, particularly a trench, uh, and this uh, um, uh, track would then be dislodged from the, from the wheels, from the idler, and, they, and the track would fall off. So they redesigned the track. William Tritton, who was the managing director for Fosters, came up with this idea. Basically a flat track plate with a set of flanges that ran underneath that would then engage with runners that went all the way along the underside of the vehicle and this solved the problem of the track sagging down beneath the vehicle. Um, and that is the format that you see on the vehicle in front of us. So it's got these new track plates fitted. However, one of the big issues that they still came across is the tank could not cross an infantry trench, an established trench, which is 10 feet wide and 8 feet deep, without no dive, nose diving in and getting stuck. So they redesigned the track system to the iconic rhomboid shape of the British heavy tanks of the First World War. This is a, a Mark II. The Mark IIs were identical to those Mark Ones that were used in combat for the first time. Um, but this is an unarmoured training tank. So they didn't put the face hardened armour plate on it, but other than that it was identical. Eight man crew inside, four guys to drive it, four guys to fight the weapon systems, centrally mounted engine, no turret because of the position of the engine um, and the fact that you would actually destabilise the frame by mounting a turret either too, forward, uh, too far forward or too far to the rear. So they mount the weapons on the side in armoured pods called sponsons. And this is a, a, a Navy concept. Um, and it tied in very, very well with the heavier guns that they were fitting, the 57mm 6-pounders, um, because they were being supplied by the Royal Navy. Towards the end of the First World War, tanks developed, tanks improved, how they used them, where they used them, changed dramatically, and then they identified the need for um, an armoured replacement for the horse. So we start to see the first of the cavalry tanks um, coming into service. Things like the, the British Medium A tank there, known as the Whippet, and the French two-man tank, the Renault FT-17 which obviously, as you war gamers will know, is actually the kind of the starting point on most of the nation's tech trees um, uh, during the game. Um, this concept obviously proved to be very, very successful, and it's this concept that survives the First World War. This tank, the cavalry tank, is then developed during the 20s and 30s, and then forms the kind of the mainstay of most of the armoured divisions during the Second World War. During the 20s and 30s, most nations emulated the British successes of the First World War as they started to develop their own armoured divisions. A lot of countries bought uh, British tanks from Vickers Armstrong, the arms manufacturer in Newcastle in the UK, 
uh, and use these as the experimental basis for their armour divisions. They then developed their own ideas, how they thought tanks should be used, how tanks should suit their own terrain, and then went on to obviously build and design their own tanks and then develop their own techniques to use those tanks. Obviously one of those nations that took it on so very, very fiercely was the Germans. Um, with all obviously the, the historical background, drove them obviously into a, another major European campaign um, in the, the very late 30s and early 40s. Um, with the techniques that they developed and the vehicles that they used to deploy those techniques, um, they uh, took armoured warfare into its next stage and the next major leap. We, we have such mass mobility that really takes um, the, the, the Western Allies by storm, takes them completely by surprise, overwhelms their defences, um, and instead of four years of trench warfare um, on the Western Front, we've got two uh, months of very, very rapid combat, which sees obviously an overwhelming German victory. Um, one of the myths that we had from that time is that the Germans beat the Western Allies because their equipment was just better than ours. And that's not true, because the bulk of German armoured divisions used light tanks like this Panzer II that we've got here and check built tanks like the, the, the PZ-35T. Now these light tanks uh, were used so very, very well that they broke through um, uh, lines of defence, overwhelmed those positions and, and achieved this, this very, very great victory. However, during this period, um, the rest of the nations obviously being um, uh, overwhelmed by these fast numbers were forced to then catch up and most nations actually had about a two year backlog um, as far as technological advancement was concerned. Um, however, everybody did realise that the way that tanks were used on the battlefield had changed. Not only was mobility particularly important, but tanks were now being used to engage other tanks in combat. They're not just for knocking out static defences and breaking through a defensive line to aid the infantry, which was obviously the case during the First World War. So the whole evolution of tanks over the next four years was rapid and very, very dramatic. Probably no more, no more dramatic than the next tank that we're going to take a look at, which is just around this corner. So every museum around the world has its has its prize piece, its jewel in the crown, um, from you know uh, Enola Gay to Sir Nigel Gresley, which was one of the fastest uh, British steam locomotives, along with the Flying Scotsman. At the Tank Museum, it's Tiger 131. Um, only six Tigers left uh, uh, in the world. Ours is the only one that's been restored to full running condition, um, and it's this Tiger that has actually a very very disproportionate. Um, impact, psychological impact on the battlefield. Uh, the Germans were very, very good with their propaganda and not only did they convince the Allies that they were, um, that they were a, a, an insurmountable um, uh, piece of equipment to be used in the field, but it also worked on the German soldiers and the German soldiers also believed that they could go anywhere and do anything with this tank. Um, however, as I say, it was very, very disproportionate because they only built 1,354 Tiger 1s. And when your opponents were mass producing reasonable vehicles, things like the American and the M4 Sherman, and the Russians building the very, very capable T-34 in vast numbers, over 50,000 of each of those chassis built, 1,300 heavy tanks weren't actually going to be an awful lot of use. This vehicle, um, by the time they'd, uh, they'd got into manufacture and deployed it at the end of 1942, the beginning of 1943, the face of warfare for the Germans had changed. Their high tide mark had been reached in North Africa uh, and it had been reached on the Eastern Front and it was then going to be a, a, a collapsing bubble around the, 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 the heart of Germany um, as the superior numbers, the superior manufacturing capability of their primary allies um, was going to tell the, um, the tide. These Tigers ended up being used, what I like to say, like Thunderbirds, international rescue. They were thrown in to the heaviest fighting to stem the tide of an attack or a counter-attack, um, and then they would then be pulled out. They'd be pulled out, refitted, shipped by, uh, by rail to the next location, and thrown into combat again. So they never actually performed their design role, which was as a breakthrough tank, a heavy breakthrough tank. Um, 
massive uh, quantity of armour protection, very, very powerful and accurate gun, obviously meant that this tank could actually outfight the bulk um, of the tanks that it had encountered um, during, the, uh, uh, during the Second World War. Tiger 131 has got a very unique story. Um, in brief, it was put in a uh, defensive position outside of Tunisia, in, um, outside of the city of Tunis in April of 1943, encountered British Churchill tanks, the 48th Royal Tank Regiment, all part of 25 Brigade coming in um, from the west as part of the American advances. Um, during a very, very sporadic and bitty engagement, this tank was disabled by a, 20, uh, by a, uh, a six pounder round fired by a Churchill which, as you can see, the damage has been preserved. A couple of indentation marks on the underside of the gun sleeve and a chunk out of the underneath of the mantle. And this round basically lodged underneath the turret and it jammed the turret. Stopped the, um, the, the turret from being able to traverse and the gun from being able to be aimed at its enemy. The armour in the roof was also deformed and we believe that deformation destroyed the radio and there were crew injuries. The crew abandoned the tank. They had a standard operating procedure to blow up any Tigers, not to let them fall into the Allied hands intact. Um, this was an exception. We've no idea what happened to the crew. They were never traced. The only thing that we ever found was from the, um, the parent company's logs, the 504th Heavy Tank Battalion, said that the crew of Tiger 131 panic after two harmless hits from Churchill tanks. Um, the vehicle obviously still very much intact with only superficial damage around the outside was then taken um, into British custody. Uh, it was used in Africa for about two weeks doing lots and lots of evaluation films uh, and identification films for, for Allied soldiers then shipped back to the UK. Because it came back intact, it was taken apart very, very carefully, we were able to put it back together again. Right, this vehicle that we've got here is probably the most complete Sherman DD tank left in the world. It's certainly the only one with a largely complete canvas screen, but somebody decided um, uh, at some point to actually cut two holes through the canvas to put viewing windows so people could actually see the inside. Um, but the Sherman DD shows the adaptability of the armoured fighting vehicle so that you can adapt it to multiple roles. Very, very simply, a large canvas screen around the outside to increase its displacement and then allow it to float two propellers on the rear so it can temporarily act as a boat. It would then be launched from a ship onto the beaches of Normandy in uh, uh, 6 of June 44. As soon as it uh, engaged with the beach and climbed out of the water, it drops the canvas screen, revealing the turret, the main armament, to then start knocking out those German machine gun nests, the heavy guns that they had, um, in order to open up and secure those beachheads. Very, very um, uh, adaptable design. Uh, the DDs were then used for crossing the Rhine later on and giving fire support to the, um, um, uh, the, the American troops taking over the, the Shell Estuary in Holland. Right, moving into the early Cold War period, this vehicle was actually designed in 1943 but didn't actually see service during the Second World War. The first model was being deployed in um, uh, May of 1945. This is the British Centurion. Uh, and the British Centurion really saw, certainly from the, the British point of view, an evolution in tank design. Rather than having infantry support tanks like the Churchill and cruiser tanks like the, the, the Comet and the Cromwell, they squished both of those overall designs together to create the first of what we now call a main battle tank. They called it a universal tank at the time, um, but its greatest feature was that the British designers thought forward for about 15 to 20 years and thought we need to design a tank that could be adapted as new technology becomes available, in particular a tank that was big enough to take larger weapons as they became available so that the British didn't have to keep on rebuilding a new tank every time something else came up. Centurion had a very, very long service with the British, went through 23 different marks and sub-marks. Uh, in its, uh, its last format, the Mark 13 had improved armour, improved firepower with a 105mm gun, infrared night fighting equipment uh, and a ranging gun to improve the first, ch the first round hit um, chances of the vehicle. Very, very well exported, over 4,000 tanks sold to, all, uh, to many European nations uh, and um, Middle Eastern countries. Um, and probably its greatest trial by combat was during the Arab-Israeli conflict of the, uh, the 50s, 60s and 70s. The Israelis bought large numbers of centurions from the British, um, obviously adapted them eventually to their own needs and to their own purposes. 
Um, but uh, it proved to be a, a very, very good fighting vehicle. Centurions still in service today. Republic of South Africa operate a main battle tank they call Oliphant. Oliphant is a highly upgraded Mark 13 Centurion. Uh, one of my favourite tanks in the collection, the, uh, the T-72, there's the T-72M, which was one of the export versions. Um, the T-72 um, uh, incorporated a lot of new design features. It mounted uh, the largest gun then in use, a 125mm smoothbore gun, which gave the, the, the tank a great deal of versatility of ammunition. Uh, uh, importantly, the ability to actually fire a wire-guided anti-tank missile down the gun tube. Um, in order to create a very, very low profile hull to reduce its silhouette and make it a harder target to hit, um, it replaces the, uh, the fourth crew member of most tanks, the loader, um, and replaces it with a 22 round auto loader carousel. Uh, this will then automatically be pre programmed with different ammunition types. With a push of a button, it will select that round, bring the, the, the carriage with the ammunition to the breech of the gun, and ram it into the gun for you. It takes about seven seconds to load a tank round. Um, and this, uh, this vehicle was also uh, with a very, very powerful diesel engine, um, very, very agile beast, very, very quick. Um, and uh, with uh, the uh, general theories that the, the, um, the Soviet Union had for tank warfare, obviously coming from their experiences during the Second World War, knew that large tank attacks were effective, the tactic worked, um, and that moment maintaining momentum, pushing forward, was, was essential to achieving victory. You had to overwhelm your opponent's forces. So one of the features that they designed into a lot of the, um, uh, their pieces of equipment was the ability to um, submerge, do a, a submerged river crossing. Hence, the, this vehicle is equipped with a snorkel. All tanks actually had snorkels as part of their standard equipment. Took the crew about 20 minutes to make all the preparations to allow it to perform these, these um, submerged river crossings, and it can do about a four to five meter submerged river crossing. Um, it would then be able to come straight up the other side and go straight into combat, right into contact. Um, all they have to do is just basically crank a handle on the underside of the gunner's hatch, that snorkel will detach. Any stoppages over coaxial machine gun or main gun, you would be able to dis discharge the weapons and it will clear those stoppages. Um, so it would allow you to basically come straight up the other side of a riverbank, straight into a defensive position and engage those enemy forces. Um, the T-72 is actually the basis for one of the current uh, um, uh, Russian main battle tanks, the T-90. Um, and a, a very, very effective piece of equipment it is with new modern armour on the outside, uh, which gives it a tremendous survivability and a new defensive aid suite, which is even designed to knock out incoming projectiles. So it's a first class piece of equipment. This particular vehicle is actually one of the pre-production prototypes V5. We've got V5 and V2 as part of the Tank Museum's collections. These were automotive trials vehicles. So it doesn't have all of the uh, uh, equipment added to it. It doesn't have the commander's optics site or the remote weapon station that's present on the uh, Mark II Challenger. Um, but uh, you get obviously a, a feel for the size and shape of the vehicle. It's, probably, it's considered to be probably one of the best protected tanks in the world with its uh, third generation Chobham armour which is now uh, under codename Dorchester. It's a laminate armour system which is at least twice as effective as steel armour. Uh, there's an awful lot of it um, and uh, it has a very, very good um, survivability record. They used Challenger 2s during the second Gulf War in 2003. Uh, one of the Challenger 2s that entered Basra was hit 70 times by tank rounds, anti-tank missiles and RPGs, not one succeeded in penetrating its armour. It's a very, very heavyweight piece of kit. Um, however, um, there are a few things that it's starting to lag behind on, things like manoeuvrability, it can't perform the kind of manoeuvres that you can do with a Leopard 2, um, and we're still using a 120mm rifle gun. It's still an effective gun, but most other NATO countries have moved on to the uh, German Rheinmetall 120 smoothbore. Um, something that I think the British will look at in the, in the not too distant future. But it's a fantastic piece of kit um, and uh, certainly very, very well loved by its crews. So there you go guys, that was a little tour around the Bovington Tank Museum here as the first prototype tank slowly revolves behind me, Little Willie, the, the machine that kind of started all, that kicked it all off. 
So I do hope this has been interesting or informative or entertaining and you know I came into this knowing almost nothing about tanks. I did my research and done the tour and I've read the stuff and it's fascinating. A hundred years of this this machine that literally changed warfare. I'm enthusiastic to learn even more about them. So I'm going to leave you here, do some more exploring of the Bombing Tank Museum, which is just a magnificent thing, absolutely magnificent. Thank you for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time.